Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. The Hagen History Center presents its speaker series, the online version. Tonight's topic is a proper seat for Emmanuel. Personal reflections on the history and meaning of the Christmas crash. Presenter tonight is Dr. Michael DeSanctis, retired Gannon University professor. This lavishly illustrated presentation will trace the history of seasonal nativity scenes as found in Christian households, churches, from the origins in the ministry of St. Francis of Assisi to the present day. The presentation will also feature an explanation of the original large-scale nativities or creches constructed over the years by Dr. DeSanctis for the benefit of the audience throughout the Erie area. Dr. DeSanctis. Hi, everybody. Great to have you all with me. I don't think I've ever had this many people in uh, my living room at any one time, but it's great to have you here. I'd like to, first of all, thank um, Jeff Sherry and Sarah Little, both who are, uh, as you know, part of the Hagen History Center for all the help they gave me with the logistics of this presentation. I'd also like to take a second to thank um, the namesake for the center itself, Mr. Tom Hagen. Many of you are familiar with his commitment to the built environment, especially in Erie, Pennsylvania. I know over the years that I taught Erie architecture at Gannon University or some of my other architecture courses, he was uh, very gracious to my students. I remember especially um, the tour he personally gave to my students a couple of years ago, of the Erie Insurance Exchange um, Heritage Center uh, near Perry Square. And um, those of you who know Tom know how much he loves architecture. He was like a kid in a, a candy store that, that afternoon and uh, was really good at explaining to my students exactly why buildings like this particular structure should be saved. And, um, and there's a message that lies there that um, we, we could even start the presentation with. Because I think Mr. Hagen has already, has always understood that the poetry that a, a city generates is just as, uh, important as anything else, the architectural poetry, but probably more important than its prose. And then if we have a renaissance going on in Erie, Pennsylvania right now, it has to be an artistic renaissance as much as a renaissance of our economic strength. I'd also like to begin by talking a little bit about how different uh, this Christmas is for me personally, and maybe for many of us, uh, usually around this time of year, I'm at uh, First Presbyterian Church of the Covenant, and again, the folks at the Covenant have been very good friends to my students over the years and have opened up the sanctuary uh, that they uh, worship in to my students. Um, uh, lately, they've been allowing me to display my crushes uh, within the sanctuary space. And uh, it always tickles me to see the kind of response that people have to these uh, works that take me about a year to put together. Um, uh, what I try to do, and I'll explain this in a little bit more detail in a couple of minutes, from year to year, is to create a, an original large-scale nativity scene or creche that will somehow convey the meaning, the content of the, uh, the gospel account of the birth of Christ. And it really does tickle me to see the response that I find from folks. Uh, the, um, the philosopher, um, um, Rollo May once said that beauty is soul-bearing. He was a psychoanalyst and he found that in a clinical setting when he asked people to describe the most beautiful experiences they ever had, to a person they would break down and start weeping. The other thing that Rollo May seemed to understand is that there's an intrinsic relationship between the experience which we call the beautiful and the experience of the holy or the sacred. And I personally understand a little bit about that and it touches my household and um, certainly influences the work that I've done since I arrived in Erie, Pennsylvania about 35 years ago um, from upstate New York by way of Ohio University. For about the past 35 years, I've maintained in one form or another a liturgical design consultancy or liturgical design uh, studio. By that, I mean that if there's a client or a community uh, in town close by or someplace throughout the country that needs to build or renovate a place of worship, um, I can be engaged to have a hand in that, either educating the client to understand how to use the space or to work alongside the architect to design a particular place of worship. 
Those of you from Erie, Pennsylvania uh, might recognize the interior space here. This is the um, uh, monastery out on East Lake Road where the Benedictines come together for their worship. If a particular piece of furniture or an appoint appointment needs to be designed, sometimes I'm engaged to do that work as well. I often publicly like to acknowledge the fact that even though I'm professionally trained, I owe a lot of what I know about liturgical design to my paternal grandfather, Ernest de Sanctus. Uh, he was born in 1888. He died in 1988. And literally, when I was a little boy, I would sit at his feet and he taught me everything about faux uh, marbleizing and stencil work and how to repair plastic plaster statues. And I was thinking just the other day when I popped this photograph into the presentation that it was in fact one of my grandfather's nativity scenes that I was introduced to as a young boy that I suspect has really affected me. Uh, he would paint uh, this this uh, piece of canvas that was attached to the altar in the church where I was raised. And uh, uh, he would do a comparable one at Easter time as well to celebrate those great feasts within uh, the church. Because there's a studio in our house, either in the attic or the basement, depending upon its need, there's always something going on in terms of design or fabrication. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, a week or so before Thanksgiving, I was fabricating wreaths for the house. And I uh, promised Steve Weiser, the head of the uh, Erie Philharmonic, that these horns were not stolen from the collection that the Philharmonic maintains. The, these were horns I was able to find that I wanted to incorporate into our wreaths for the home. They uh, gave way to the uh, Christmas card that I designed for our household that will be sent out pretty soon. I shared that with you because over the years uh, for my clients and friends around Christmas time, I was always in the habit of designing and fabricating some kind of gift. We would box these up and send them all over the country to the people with whom I had done some kind of design work. I was also raising four children. I have four children, all of whom are now grown. They're all young adults and uh, raising them in my household, I wanted to teach them something about the birth of Jesus Christ. So I began building, uh, I don't know, 29 years ago now, almost 30 years ago now, uh, large uh, nativity scenes or creches. And I made something of a personal competition uh, or a challenge out of this. I decided that each of these pieces would have to be made by hand from easily accessible materials. And they would somehow take the, the gospel account of Jesus' birth and convey that to some other great culture. And of course, one of the things I love is the culture of Italy. So in these particular pieces, you'll see Italian words as opposed to words from ancient Palestine. And Christians have done this for many, many centuries. We take the gospel story, the gospel account of the birth of Jesus, and we transport it to another place. To this day, my children will sometimes joke about the fate of some of these pieces. Uh, this was a little well that I designed and fabricated uh, one year, and uh, um, I decided to cut some corners. So the stones that the well is made from are, are in fact, little cocoa puffs. And I figured that a, a layer or two of polyurethane would be enough to protect the cocoa puffs from disintegration. What I didn't account for were the mice that were in the attic at the time, and so when I opened the box one, um, one year to uh, unveil the parts of the crash, I decided to discover that the mice had already done some work on my, my level of little object. I taught at Cannon University for 34 years at the same time that I was doing my consulting work. And the university always gave me a very uh, long tether to do work throughout the country. Uh, it was always an extension of the work I did in the classroom. I taught in both the fine arts program and the theology program, and I loved kind of um, synthesizing or bringing together the content of both of those departments. One of the courses I used to love to teach was the theology of Christian worship, for which I was able to take students throughout the city of Erie, Pennsylvania, uh, use Erie as our laboratory, and to, uh, to go into the great uh, architectural structures that were dedicated to worship. What I discovered about 15 or 20 years ago, though, is that increasingly my students weren't terribly literate when it came to scriptural stories. They simply didn't know the Bible. And I'm not trying to uh, criticize any particular Gannon student or generation of Gannon students, but it's simply the case that as America has become increasingly secularized, 
fewer and fewer people are attached to churches, fewer and fewer people have the experience of Sunday school, so therefore fewer and pe fewer people know kind of the, uh, the iconography or the hieroglyphics really of our culture. For example, if I mention Adam and Eve in class, uh, in, in my fine arts courses or my theology courses, most of the students would balk beyond perhaps identifying something like an apple that had been eaten. Or if I talked uh, likewise about um, Jonah and the whale, if I talked about um, David and Goliath, and of course, how can you talk about the Italian Renaissance or somebody like Michelangelo Bonarotti without referring to the story of David and Goliath? I found that my stu students simply didn't have the wherewithal to, um, to talk about those stories. The same thing applied, believe it or not, to the Christmas story itself, beyond just the general outline of that narrative. I, uh, we shouldn't um, sort of criticize just the students you find at the undergraduate level. Um, a couple of years ago, I was at the Cleveland Museum of Art where I took this photograph and I happened to have been in the medieval galleries and I heard a little boy talking with his parents. I could overhear their conversation. A little boy who was probably seven or eight years old asked a very innocent and logical question. He said to his mom, first of all, mommy, how come all those people have circles on their heads? And I paused and I listened for a second and I presumed that the mom would probably use a word like halo or make some attempt to explain why those people were wearing those circles around their heads. Um, assuming, as I did, that she had some kind of rudimentary or fundamental notion of the Bible or scripture or the Judeo tradition, Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, the mom handed her son over to her husband and said, you explain it to him. And the husband was no better able to explain why all the characters in these paintings who had circles on their heads were painted that way, were depicted that way. And again, I'm not pointing out anything that's um, exclusively connected to theology. It's, it's actually something that points to a, an issue that exists in our culture today as we become less and less informed about scriptural sources of mythology, storytelling, and so forth. Um, we're unable to carry on those traditions. So I said to myself, look, we have this wonderful bookstore with these great showcase windows. Why couldn't I use that space as an extension of the classroom? And I began a bunch of years ago, first of all, by trying to explain to my theology and fine arts students a little bit about the origin of the Advent wreath, the Advent tradition, which um, as many of you know, is that, that period kind of like Lent um, as uh, can, Lent connected to Easter. It's a, a period of about a month, four weeks, um, by which uh, Christians prepare themselves not just for Christmas, but for the, uh, the coming of Christ into their lives in the, the fullest way possible. And uh, in this little presentation, I tried to explain the history of the Advent wreath and where this Advent tradition came from. And then I said to myself, well, we have this wonderful facility, this wonderful resource, what if I were to use it more explicitly to talk about the birth of the Messiah, the birth of Christ, by creating large-scale nativity scenes, and maybe even get my students off of their cell phones once in a while, but do it with the least words possible. To do that, I enlisted the help of one of my great heroes, St. Francis of Assisi, and what I find is that Francis is someone who speaks to people of every generation, even folks who aren't particularly religious, even folks who don't believe in God at all are very much intrigued by this, this wonderful Franciscan individual who came from the middle part of Italy. He once said, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words, based upon the presumption that our actions should probably speak more loudly than our words. For me to tell you a little bit about the <clears throat> preaching style of uh, St. Francis and why he's so significant to the story, let me take you to the central part of Italy, which is always something I love doing. Uh, Italy, as many of you know, is roughly the shape and the size of California. And there's a province right smack in the middle, right in the green belly of that country. Uh, it's called Umbria that we need to go to today. As most of you know, Francis was from Assisi and Assisi is a small village in that province. If we had time tonight, I would take you to Perugia, which isn't very far away. Those of you intrigued by the history of uh, banking, even American banking, uh, you might want to go to Perugia to see one of the oldest banks in the world. The word bank itself, banco, 
is an Italian word that was developed uh, during the rise of capitalism. And uh, we could go there and maybe buy some bocce, some, some, uh, some kisses, like Hershey's kisses, that are actually made in Perugia. Or we could look at the paintings of Perugino, a man who actually adopted the name of his hometown and who painted images like the nativity that you see here. But let's stick with Assisi, since that's the place that we associate most closely with uh, our, our great uh, friend, St. Francis. Those of you who've been to Assisi know that it's a hill town, a very hilly town. And uh, way up at the top of the town, there's a, a place called Rocco Maggiore, the, the, the large rock, the large hill. And if you climb up there, and I have a couple of times, you can look down upon the double basilica uh, in which France is actually entombed today. There, there's one great nave built on top of the shoulders of another great nave. Uh, he's buried in the bottommost nave of that space. And you can look over this incredible valley with little hills in the, in the distance. And that's the very uh, landscape that Francis himself fell in love with, this, this heartbreakingly beautiful Italian landscape. I know that folks today love to talk about Tuscany and living under the Tuscan sun, but Umbria, for my money, is just as beautiful as any Tuscan uh, landscape. And this, of course, is the landscape that many people of Francis's generation uh, early Renaissance, proto-Renaissance thinkers were beginning to fall in love with. They, they began to realize that the world is so heartbreakingly beautiful, and they were trying to reconcile somehow the notion that the fall of Adam and Eve had tainted this world from the experience they were having with their eyes. You think about somebody like Giotto, for example, Giotto, who is um, roughly a, a contemporary of Francis, when he paints something like the Lamentation, and I know the image I have here is kind of a postage stamp size painting, but it might work on the monitors of your uh, laptops. We have Mary, the mother of Christ, who's weeping over the dead, defeated, crucified body of her son. You see how puffy her eyes are, and you see how she's invested with the kind of psychology that you and I would understand. These Palestinian women who were there at the uh, crucifixion of Jesus they act the way you and I would act in the same situation. And Giotto not only invests the scene with kind of a human psychology, he, he places the lamentation within a landscape that you and I can recognize. It has trees, it has rock formations, it has a cobalt blue sky. Even the angels who probably wish they were human act like members of the human race, all set within a kind of a stage setting that is three-dimensional so different from the kind of paintings of the medieval period, let's say seven or 800 years ago, that were stilted, artificial, uh, much more like Egyptian hieroglyphics in the sense that they spoke through symbolism that was highly stylized. Or think about someone like Dante, who rather than sharing with the people of his time ecclesiastical Latin or some kind of highfalutin language, cast his poetry into Italian language, the language of the streets, that people could comprehend. Francis is part of that group. He's part of that temper. He's, he's breathing the air, that Renaissance air at the time. Um, and uh, what's affecting him is this preoccupation, what, what is sometimes called dolce stile nuovo by Italians or fancy art historians, a sweet new style that began to pervade uh, the thinking of the people of his time. You and I would simply call it the vernacular. Casting, the gospel story into the vernacular and not being afraid of saying, you know, it's true that Jesus sits at the right of the hand of the Father and that we can conceive of him as being the Rex Celestis, the heavenly king, that Jesus is enthroned with his mother in heaven, in this painting kind of laminated on a golden background to indicate that, surrounded by an angelic consort. But he's also the Christ who comes to us as an infant in a couple of hundred years, people like Raffaello, Raphael would paint uh, Mary, the mother of Christ, with her nephew, John the Baptist, and her son, Jesus of Nazareth, in a landscape that it's completely recognizable. It almost looks like something that Audubon would have painted in the 19th century when he cataloged topography and plant forms and so forth. And they take the incarnation of Jesus so seriously to be explicit about it, they were even convicted in the way that they paint his genitals. Imagine that leap of faith. Imagine not only taking the divinity of Christ seriously, but taking his humanity seriously. It's pretty scary, pretty intimidating stuff, terrifying stuff. 
to such a degree that most Christians don't even want to think about the humanity of Jesus. And what G Francis and his generation really ask us to think about is this. Can the divine be found someplace else than in another world, another realm? The divine can be found here and now, here in this world, in the world that you and I reside in, in the world that was so heartbreakingly beautiful to Francis himself. But heaven and earth are somehow reconciled in the mind of Francis. You might say, well, how are they reconciled? Well, given the nature of this talk, they're reconciled in the person of Jesus Christ, whom Christians believe is both God and man, fully God and fully man. He's fully human except in every way except for sin. Pretty profound kind of idea. And one thing that certainly makes Christian belief pretty radical. We tend to not think of Christianity as a radical religion today, 2,000 years after its beginning. But when you take the incarnation seriously and the notion that somehow God and heaven are reconciled, you begin to realize how incredibly um, uh, difficult a theology this is and challenging a theology this is. Francis and his generation look out into the world and they see something beautiful. Coincidentally, and this might be interesting to some of you, we have Pope Francis, you know, leading the Roman Catholic Church today, and Francis is both a Jesuit priest, but also a Franciscan. He took the name of Francis himself, his hero. And the very first encyclical that he promulgated 15 years ago was Laudato Si, an encyclical on the, uh, the environment, the natural environment. He takes the title of the encyclical from St. Francis's Canticle of the Sun. Makes sense because he's a Franciscan. He sees the world not as a threat or as a trap, not as the place that's going to cause Satan to keep us from the heavenly Jerusalem, but as some place that actually reveals the glory of God. Let's go back to the basilica that I showed you earlier. If you walk through the front door of the basilica and simply turn to the right and look up to the second register, noting that every inch of that building has been covered with frescoes, yeah, which is a wonderful painting of a group of monks, Franciscan monks. They're in the chancel of a basilica-style building, and they're all singing the parts of the Mass. My, my friend Tom Brooks, who is the conductor of the Erie Philharmonic Chorus, would probably in, be intrigued by this painting. Some of those tenors in the back look like they're really reaching for the high notes. But at the bottom of this coro, this chorus, of monks, you see this singular monk, this is Francis himself, and he's placing into a crib, a crib that, by the way, looks a heck of a lot like a, um, a mausoleum or a tomb, and there is that fascinating connection between those two things. Francis is doing this not in the city of Assisi, but down in another Umbrian town called Greccio, Greccio. and that's where I have to take you to if we're going to talk ab about the birth of the nativity scene, which we attribute to Francis himself. Francis was actually uh, attached to a parish church for a while in the town of Greccio, where it snows occasionally, and you see it here in this photograph. And even today, if you go to the town of Greccio, you'll find sounds, signs on the outskirts that look something like this. They're kind of advertisements for the historical significance of the town. See what they say? Not only is the town called Greccio, but it's luogo del primo preceptio del mondo, the place or the location of the very first nativity scene in the world. And it doesn't take an etymologist or a fancy scholar in language to realize that if you corrupt that word Greccio just a little and cast it into the French, you get the word crash. Our French word crash, though it does have associations with mangers, is uh, connected etymologically to the word Greccio, the birthplace of the modern nativity scene, uh, again, that we attribute to St. Francis. What Francis does is, on a Christmas Eve, is to present a real live baby in a manger adjacent to an altar. He's, he's making a connection between the, the birth of the Christ child, the incarnation, and the liturgy of the Eucharist, which is so central to Catholics at the time, but also even today. Francis is, is an Italian, for goodness sake. His, his mother was French, hence his name, but his dad was an Italian. And he knows that when Italians eat, they say mangia. It's almost a command, mangia, from the verb mangiare. And he knows that somehow, implicated in the manger that we read about in the gospel story of Jesus' birth, is the notion that 
Christ is consumed by us. There's a almost a Eucharistic um, dimension to the birth of Christ, to the birth of the Christ child. You might say, Michael, well, how can we possibly consume the Christ child? Those of you, especially who are moms, haven't you ever said to your babies, I love you so much, I could just eat you up. I know I've done that to my four babies. I love you so much, Rachel. I love you so much, Matthew. I could just eat you up. And I nibble on their toes and I nibble on their elbows and I call them sweetie or honey or all those highly caloric words that somehow have to do with my desire to devour them. Francis is trying to say that this manna from heaven that we call the Christ or this bread of life that we call the Eucharist are somehow connected to each other. We consume God just as we are consumed by God in the mystery that we like to call the incarnation. Just a fancy word for God taking on carnem, carne, taking on human flesh, flesh just like ours. I know that even today there are some people, might be some people suspect of all of this or who might still believe that this is all a form of idolatry. Why would adults go around kissing little plaster statues of the Christ child? But think about it this way. Francis came out of a liturgical tradition, a Christian tradition that takes the word of God so seriously that then when the word is proclaimed in a, a service, the book of Gospels is actually kissed by the presiding priest. It goes on today in every Catholic church in the world every day of the week. The truth is we human beings live by our symbols. Symbols are significant to us. We reverence them, we caress them, we acknowledge them, we exalt them, not because we're idol makers or idolatrous, but because they're important to us. They reveal things to us. And again, if you think about it logically, if Catholic Christians reverence the word of God so much that they're willing to kiss the book of Gospels, why would it be inappropriate to reverence the word of God made flesh? Christ is, after all, the image of the unseen God. He's not just the word of God made flesh. He's the image of the unseen God. And his images can give us the opportunity to rehearse the skills we need for actually acknowledging, uh, acknowledging the Christ that we find in each other. Now, this photograph is kind of intriguing. You've probably heard over the, over the years about Pope Francis and other popes uh, washing the feet of those in prisons in, in the city of Rome. Look at the woman in the background who's just marveling at the fact that the Pope, the head of the Roman Catholic Church, is kissing the feet of a Muslim prisoner in the town of Rome, out of deference to that person, out of deference to the Christ who's found in that person. With all of that as background, let me explain that we've all ex had experiences as students of learning something from a chalkboard, although <laughs> nowadays it's all electronic, as we know, and uh, We've all been sort of raised on PowerPoints and so forth. Old-fashioned chalkboards are kind of important to us, however. And for many years, I've been intrigued by what I call chalkware theology, and I've, I've written extensively about it. Here's an article from Commonweal Magazine from a couple of years ago, where I talked about what I call chalkware theology. And chalkware is just another fancy word for plaster. I did a little Google search for all of you, and I found the word chalkware. Uh, here's the kind of chalkware that my grandfather taught me to repair many, many years ago. And every once in a while, these things will come into my studio and somebody will frantically ask me to fix the head of a, a statue made of chalkware, a calcium carbonate, plaster. Why do I bring that up? Well, I began to say to myself, let's use those windows in the bookstore that I showed you earlier as uh, an extension of my classroom, ways of teaching the gospel story and incorporate into these large-scale crushes the chalkware pieces that I could find uh, in different places, from different places in Erie, Pennsylvania. Here's a piece, for example, that I made in 2014 that um, gave me the opportunity to talk about a couple of things simultaneously or to learn about a couple of things simultaneously. I'm a, a, a trained architectural historian as well as an art historian. I've always believed that um, the best way to start a project like this is through drawing. The concept becomes a drawing, which is an incarnational process. The drawing becomes a model, which is also incarnational. And then the model becomes a three-dimensional object. It's, it takes on greater and greater flesh as it develops, from idea to drawing to real three-dimensional object. And as an architectural historian, I've always loved Tudor architecture. Many of you do. 
half timbered structures. And I tried to create a half timbered structure from the Middle Ages that uh, certainly doesn't really connect too much to ancient Palestine. But again, the Christ story can be transported to cultures all over the world. For a project like this, obviously, I have to create all the parts, including the glazing. And I had struggled with creating the windows for this particular structure. I was able to get the blinds or the shutters correct and the, the stones there of the arch and so forth. But I thought to myself, how am I going to create in an easy way that lattice work of wood pieces, those glazing bars, those kamis that are part of the glazing process? It finally dawned on me. I went to the dollar store and I found these oversized fly swatters. And I thought to myself, there's the matrix, there's the network. And you're free to steal all of these ideas yourself the next time you decide to make a half timbered structure. And that was a simple way of creating the glazing for this particular uh, project. I love solving the problems. That's um, half of the fun of these projects and uh, certainly something that I always conveyed to my students, become problem solvers. I also decided that I wanted to place in this uh, nativity scene, good old American pumpkin, a good old American lantern. Uh, to kind of give it a totally different sort of context. And here's the way the finished piece looked when I eventually placed it on the other side of the glass in the bookstore. It's kind of like putting a watercolor beneath glass. It just sort of comes alive and becomes crystallized there. This is the piece from 2015, uh, which was a little bit more complicated. These pieces got more and more complicated as they developed. It too began with uh, little thumbnail sketches and drawings. Uh, for those of you who are writers, Drawing is just like writing. It's a way of giving form to your ideas. It's one reason I write every day. It's also a reason that I love to draw every day. When you commit an idea to a piece of paper, it gives it some form, it incarnates it. I knew um, in this project that I wanted to play around with that little arcuated or arch shape that you see there. I also wanted to play around with the kind of external or exterior steps that you sometimes see in Palestinian architecture. And so the project began probably in the January of the year and uh, with a big uh, refrigerator box or something like that. The large architectural pieces began to come together. And then, you know, because a lot of this is trial and error, I began to realize halfway through the thing that the scale of the staircase was all wrong. It was just too large. So it all had to be ripped apart and I had to start all over again and create a new staircase. And uh, using some spackling compound and a lot of stuff that I have around my studio, I was able slowly, step by step, to create the, uh, the appearance, at least, of an ancient, uh, an ancient building. All of these pieces, by the way, have to be engineered so I can get them out of my attic. And uh, over the years, the attic door has become more of a parallelogram than a rectangle. So I have to be concerned about that, getting them out the attic and also out of my living room into my car uh, and then set up at the site, uh, depending upon where they're gonna be exhibited. And as I was looking at this photograph earlier in preparation, I was thinking about how much I owe my high school theater teacher, Mr. Robert Barone, who now lives in Rochester, New York, for giving me the opportunity to design sets for the stage because there's something very set-like in these nativity scenes, though they might be at a different scale. I'm sorry, I'll just go back a couple of clicks. All of these have to be, uh, I have to be able to fit them in my SUV to carry them from one place to another. In 2016, I decided to play around with the idea of a cave because in some interpretations of Jesus' birth, um, Mary places the Christ child in a cave or the nativity actually unfolds in a cave. A cave is a wonderful metaphor. It's a wonderful kind of uh, archetype for the idea of a womb too, and a sacred space and a tabernacle and a niche. Um, this, what you're seeing now is a large poster that would have been attached to my nativity scene to help my Gannon students understand a little bit about the logic of its design. And this piece too probably began with a big refrigerator box or furniture box of some kind. And uh, it gave me the opportunity to learn so much about something like lichen. What does lichen really look like? How does it attach to a surface? And how can I create the illusion of that? I'm always learning something from these projects. And beneath glass, it looked sort of spectacular. It gave me the opportunity too to play with something that I had always wanted to design, and that was a palm tree. 
And that meant that I had to start by creating the leaves. And then I had to uh, cut those leaves and modify their texture. And I hope you can uh, discern uh, what that object eventually looked like. It also gave me the opportunity to try to create the illusion of a, an ember fire. And I really struggled with this. It was easy enough to create the pieces of wood and the imitation of stone and some, so forth. I wasn't using Cocoa Krispies at that point or uh, Cocoa Puffs. But I couldn't quite get the glow of the embers correct. And I thought back again to my experience in high school theater class. And I remember the gels that we used to use on the front of the lamps. Um, and I thought to myself, how could I create a similar kind of translucent colored material? And then it dawned on me. I bought a four pound bag of butterscotch candies at the dollar store. I seem to always be going there. And I used the wrappers from the, uh, the butterscotch uh, candies as the lenses for the uh, ember that you see there. Again, you're free to use these ideas. I'm not sure how many of you believe in miracles, but let me share you, with you a story that's a little bit miraculous. Here is one of the pieces being wheeled into First Presbyterian Church of the Covenant. And on the day that I was putting this uh, nativity scene together, I forgot this large aspect of it, this large part of it, on the top of my SUV. And I left the site. I took off for lunch and I went elsewhere. Well, I drove from First Presbyterian Church of the Covenant in downtown Erie, Pennsylvania, all the way to a strip mall at 12th and Pittsburgh. That's about three and a half miles. And wouldn't you know it, when I got to the parking lot in the strip mall, the piece was still on top of the SUV. I can't explain it. I have maybe, again, an angelic consort followed me along the way and uh, they were responsible for keeping the piece on my car. In 2017, I, I built this piece. Um, uh, this is a, a sort of a complicated work that uh, was based upon ideas that I derived from Roman uh, temples or Roman ediculas and street theaters and Punch and Judy shows. There, there's kind of a formal connection between those kinds of things. And in fact, as some of you know, Punch and Judy is really an abbreviation for Pontius Pilate and Judas, uh, derived from scripture, obviously. And my good friends at uh, Giant Eagle grocery stores locally are very good to save for me these displays that come, uh, come to us around Christmas time. And this particular Nabisco display was the perfect size and scale for me to use to create the, uh, the presentation that you see here. Uh, again, I, I love uh, Tudor style, uh, half timbered structures, and I kind of made a housing, a sacred niche or tabernacle based upon that. In this particular piece, I wanted to create motion. So I um, was able to find a, um, a synchronous uh, motor someplace, I forgot where I found this, and I built a little truss in the gable that I put at the top of the thing. And I was able to build these angels that actually do what angels do do. They're able to fly around the Holy Family at the center of the crash. But this goes one step further. The angels themselves are made from little army men. I was looking for a convenient way to create those figures. So what I was able to do in a roundabout way is really talk about the content from uh, the prophet Isaiah, where he talks about pounding our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks. I was able to teach my students in kind of an oblique way. In 2018, uh, the piece was much more complicated. And rather than being just a traditional nativity scene, I tried to talk about the gold, frankincense, and myrrh that the Magi brought to the Christ child um, in a roundabout way by, by creating objects that would have been part of maybe a medieval tableau or a medieval presentation in an art gallery. Each of the objects you see there might look as if they actually came from the Middle Ages, maybe seven or 800 years ago, but they're made from cardboard or foam core board or you, you see the top of that, um, that ciborium there where the, the letters IHS appear. That's actually a funnel, like the kind of funnel that you would put oil through, believe it or not. The centerpiece for this particular work was um, put on a platter that rotated 360 degrees. And it was my replication of an object that you can find at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. It began with a clementine uh, box that uh, grew some legs and grew some other parts and grew a little bit larger. And 
when this piece was originally used during the Middle Ages, the jingle bells were there to, uh, to announce to the nuns who owned the little crib whether Satan himself was trying to reach into Jesus' crib to, uh, to rob him from their possession. This is the piece from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's called The Crib of uh, the Christ Child. And here's my imitation of the same piece. Not a bad replication for something that came from Clementine boxes and so forth. The hardest part for me was to create the angels. How do you create these little angelic beings? Well, what I did is I went to a uh, trash to treasure store that I love to haunt. And uh, I found these little packaged um, ornaments that go on the top of a, um, a cake for a graduation, somebody who's graduated or commenced. And then using a Dremel tool, I cut them down to size. And all they needed were some wings, and I was able to create uh, the angelic forms that you saw. You might say, well, Michael, where do you find things like those little cake decorations? Well, there's a store at 26 and Peach in the shadow of St. John's Church in Erie, Pennsylvania, that I haunt on Saturday mornings. I'm, I'm there all the time finding the materials that I need for building an object such as this one. And in some ways, again, this sort of points to the meaning of the incarnation or Christmas itself. Christ takes on, that God takes on human flesh, transforms it into something greater than we could even imagine, the, the divinization of human flesh. This is a piece from 2019. This was in the form of uh, a retablo, which is a form that I've always been really intrigued by. Some of you who know liturgical history might know that during the Middle Ages, there were these altar pieces that were set up on top of and beyond what's called the mensa of the altar. They were called a ray table or retable. And um, in Spanish, the word retablos means pretty much the same kind of a thing. And in the, in the country of Peru, these retablos are made by folks uh, sort of as little niches or sacred tabernacles in which uh, a tableau of the nativity, for example, might be uh, presented. Mine, however, is about five feet tall and pretty large. I had to begin by creating the, the, the vessel itself and then piece by piece using, I think, paper mache, if I'm not mistaken. I put together these, uh, these objects, these figures. There was something whim whimsical and kind of um, a little bit fun about this particular piece. And I learned something from this as well. I, I always learn something from these presentations. When I was wrapping the Christ child in swaddling clothes, I was reminded of that detail from the gospel story and, and also the meaning of that, that the ancient Hebrew people would wrap their babies in those bandages, but they would also wrap their dead in them. What implication that has, the fact that the second person of the Trinity becomes a member of the human race, he's laid in a manger, and he's wrapped just as a dead man might be wrapped someday. And of course, that sort of points to the the death of Jesus himself, something that for which we might uh, want to celebrate uh, in our glorias. And then finally, this, uh, this year itself, 2020, I was um, intrigued by some things that I had seen with my own eyes around Erie, Pennsylvania. Maybe some of you saw the very kind uh, little essay that Meg Longcherick wrote for the Times News recently to describe some of my motivation behind this piece. Um, it began actually um, with this, this lithograph. This is a turn of the 20th century uh, work of art from about 1901, 1902. It's actually part of a larger German poster uh, that was part of, a, it had like a temperance content or message behind it. And uh, I always found this particular work very moving to me. The, the gentleman on the outside is sort of divided from the singers on the inside of the church by this rail which to me seems so much like a chancel rail of some sort. This particular piece was also influenced by something that I photographed here. This is actually my photograph of the grounds around First Presbyterian Church of the Covenant. And somebody had decided to leave all of that garbage around the base of the church, which I tried to replicate as you're going to see in a second in some of the detail of my work. I was also influenced by uh, thinking about the poor in Erie and elsewhere throughout the country. A uh, question always uh, is given to us, what do we do with the poor? Jesus himself said the poor will always be with us. And I was concerned about their plight. So again, this piece began with a color sketch. It 
eventually evolved to a three-dimensional massing model to give me an idea of what the parts would look like. And then it eventually became this large tableau, which is really built of about, about four different pieces. There's the facade of a church. There is what you and I would probably associate with a prefab crash or nativity scene, the kind that we would see on the outskirts of a church building or on the campus of a church. There's a little sign that indicates that there's a nativity close by. And then there is the figure of the homeless person living in a cardboard box. Uh, the project began something like this um, way back in, I think, December of last year, or maybe January of this year. Eventually, that facade wall looks something like that. Eventually, I had to give it a downspout and a lot of dirt <laughs> and polyurethane. I love polyurethane. I think I brushed my teeth with polyurethane. And then, of course, I had to give it snow and ice if it were going to refer to anything in Erie, Pennsylvania. Once again, I had the problem of having to glaze the building. I had to put glass in it, uh, fenestration in it. So one chilly, I think, February afternoon, I began making the windows that would eventually be popped into the facade of the building. And then the coins that you see around the windows and uh, had to also fabricate the, the crush, the prefab sort of imitation plywood crush that you see there. All of this came along pretty quickly after a while. And then the little sign that points people to the nativity scene. Uh, keeping Christ in Christmas is becoming more and more of a difficulty. And then as a kind of a metrical device, as a measuring device, I built this little man that you see on the left-hand side. Uh, he, he eventually had it so I could make a three-dimensional version of him because he eventually became the unseen figure that is wrapped in that, uh, that cloak uh, within the, uh, the home that is actually a box. And the strange thing about this experience is that as I worked on the homeless person, it began to have an effect on me. I mean, I knew obviously logically that it wasn't a real person living there. But as I worked on the piece, I got sadder and sadder. I, uh, it became a touch piece. It became a sacrament. It became a reminder of the fact that we really do have the poor in our neighborhoods in places like Erie, Pennsylvania. When I was setting this piece up just a couple of weeks ago in First Presbyterian Church of the Covenant, I naively thought to myself, I bet this is the first time that a figure of a homeless person has been within the confines of this facility. And then it dawned on me, the entire undercroft at Covenant Church is given over to the poor and the homeless in the course of the winter. And my friends there do a marvelous job of ministering to those people. I've always been convinced that you can't really have a liturgical conscience if you don't have a social one as well. And I think my, my friends there at Covenant Church are certainly conscious of the needs of the poor. And, and, and Francis himself, going back to his incredible ministry, there's not an Italian child alive today who doesn't know that St. Francis was called il poverello, the little poor one. And he believed that being poor, being impoverished was somehow uh, the closest thing that we could approximate to the life of Christ. What about the future? Well, believe it or not, I've already begun to work on the crash for 2021. I made a little color sketch of it the other day. It's going to look something like that. I thought to myself, wait a second, how am I going to create the little push cart aspect of this? Well, that's easy enough nowadays. You just go to Craigslist and you find a tea cart, which I finally decided upon. And the woman I purchased it from was absolutely horrified when she discovered that I was going to instantly disassemble the tea cart and begin to turn it into the push cart for my crash for 2021. So, um, so a year from now, I hope we can all meet again together here in my living room and I'll be able to show you the, the finished project. We live in a time when the Christ story itself and all the artistic traditions connected to it are sort of being um, simplified or trivialized. But I, uh, I'm moved by the fact that the people who see my works, like this woman who lives in Methodist Towers in downtown Erie, Pennsylvania, and who said that she prayed in the presence of my crushes, People like this woman are somehow touched by the works that I create, which is the reason why I'll probably go on um, continuing to make these objects and offering them to the entire Erie community. Thanks for joining us here at the History Center. Thank you again, Jeff and Sarah. Sarah Little, a former student of mine, for helping with all the logistics. 
I hope you could all hear me with my scratchy voice. And um, are we going to open it to questions, uh, Jeff? Or well, right now, Michael, I don't have anybody uh, any questions, uh, but I want to tell you that that was fantastic. Um, right. A little bit not long. Only, I know that you wanted it to be about no, forty-five minutes. No, no, that, that's fine. Not only the artwork, but the uh, the history and the, the theology right. behind it is it's the sim the symbolism is impressive. Sure. Well, uh, you're the historian, and you realize that we um, we we really aren't very good at remembering our past anymore. No, and, uh, no, we're we not. Really I, need to reappropriate I wish, all of that. I, I wish you had been around when I was in in the in high school because I <laughs> I tried to make some. Uh, dioramas for you know model tanks and oh, okay things. And some of the things i came up with you know the use of cardboard and <laughs> things like that it was a drill you know it was amazing I can and I, I i really really uh, admire and respect your skill i'm not in any way trying to put myself on on the level of what you've done but i, I just i find it amazing i could look at them all day we recently had a diorama of the ear extension canal uh, added to the uh, uh, <coughs> new, soon to be open canal exhibit, and I, I could look at it all day long. I, hope, sure. I encourage yeah. you to come in and see it, and I see will. what they I did. Will. Uh, it's very nice. Uh, as of this point, I'm being told that we have no questions. I, I just, I can't say enough. I, I think you did a wonderful job.